Good evening. I'm Spot on Weather meteorologist Matthew Euler, and I'm happy to announce this particular year um, that I'm developing a series of weather training videos, and they're titled How the Weather Works. In addition to How the Weather Works training series, I'm also working on uh, basic weather tools, uh, for example, how to understand uh, the basic weather charts, as well as things such as um, forecasting using cloud, using the clouds, for example. So I'm very excited to kick off this How the Weather Works training series tonight here on Easter. Um, hopefully everybody had a great Easter Sunday. Um, if you really are into the weather like we are, I'm definitely um, happy to present this training series. And hopefully you'll learn, I'll be able to break this down in simplistic terms for everyone out there to learn how the weather really works. And it's a really exciting thing, especially you live in an area in the United States or even anywhere around the world where the weather changes on a constant basis. So this image here on tonight's title slide for the training is a photo courtesy of NASA, and it shows uh, over an overshooting thunderstorm cloud top, as well as that flattened structure of a thunderstorm as um, the stratosphere, that second layer of the atmosphere acts like a lid on these strong, vertical, vertically driven air as it rises, these convective currents. And, uh, you know, this is a great shot here to kick things off. We are now in the month of April, in the year 2022, and yeah, we're heading in that thunderstorm time of year for sure, especially across the middle latitudes of the United States and in other parts of the world even. So again, welcome to the How the Weather Works training series. This is part one. Now in tonight's video, in part one, I'm going to cover um, the atmospheric vertical structure, kind of like how that works, and then also I'm going to get into the various lifting mechanisms. What causes the air to rise? <clears throat> All right, so let's get right into the training. By the way, each of these parts or modules, um, I, I intend to keep this fairly short on the order of 15 to maybe max 20 slides. Um, I've built six of these uh, training presentations already, um, plus I have two other ones, the uh, how to interpret basic weather charts, as well as forecasting using clouds and observation, which I hope you find really handy. I'm working even more on additional ones that will last throughout the summer as well. So let's get into tonight's training, How the Weather Works Part 1, covering atmospheric vertical structure as well as lifting mechanisms. So let's start. Now, when we talk about atmospheric vertical structure, the vertical structure overall is going to result generally from a balance. And you know, that's the key term. Everything in nature seeks balance or equilibrium. When we talk about the atmosphere, the vertical structure, also is resulting from this balance between the downward directed force of gravity and that upward directed pressure gradient force. And they act equal and opposite in direction to each other. This yields what's known as hydrostatic balance. And I'll show you an example of this graphically here in a moment. <clears throat> now molecules of the atmosphere itself, regardless of how high they are above the Earth's surface, the altitude, they are going to feel some sort of gravitational acceleration towards the Earth's center of mass. The distribution of pressure with height in that vertical column is going to produce a pressure, what's known as a pressure gradient force, or a change in pressure over that vertical distance from the surface and higher up above where we live, above the ground. And this is always going to act from areas of higher pressure. We usually have higher pressure or more tightly packed air molecules closer to the Earth's surface, and it's going to act upward towards areas of lower pressure aloft where those air molecules are not as tightly packed and the density is much less. Now gravity is going to balance the upper directed pressure gradient force so that the Earth's atmosphere does not escape out in outer space. Here is a great uh, diagram showing what hydrostatic balance is all about. And so 
you know, we may have rising air motion. We have this pressure gradient force directed upward from the ground, higher pressure at the surface, aloft. You see that graphic on the right? This is, by the way, courtesy of the weatherprediction.com, Jeff Habe. Um, generally, you see that relative H, that H stands for high pressure, about 1,000 millibars on the surface. And then we go up to about 100 millibars. That's way, way high up. Um, that's actually above, you know, 50,000 feet in the atmosphere. And that's generally where we're going to have less density, less packing of the air molecules, and generally relatively low pressure, that relatively L, that relative L. So everything is going to flow. Upper director pressure gradient force, represented by the red arrow on the left. And then you have the downward directed force of gravity. It's always acting downward. And that's represented by the purple arrow. Now when the pressure gradient force on the left, the red arrow, is equal and opposite to the gravitational force acting downward towards Earth's surface, that's when we achieve hydrostatic balance. Now, overall, we talk about solar radiation. The sun is really the driver of all weather. Equatorial regions in general of the Earth are going to receive more direct and intense solar radiation than, let's say, the polar regions. So what does that do? Temperature and thickness and an air column are directly proportional to each other. So over the equator with much more intense solar radiation, I have... An air column that is generally warmer than at the poles. The air column is going to be colder or much shorter. Now, warmer air parcels are going to occupy a greater volume than the cold ones of equal mass do. When you have a warmer air parcel column of air, um, the molecules are going to be um, moving around much more rapidly. They're going to expand and, and, and become much further apart when that column of air is warmer as compared to cold columns of air, which you'd have typically over the polar areas, um, where the molecules are packed much more tightly close together, and the air column overall is going to be shorter. And I'm going to show you an example graphically of this in a moment. So therefore, taking into account warmer air parcels expand and occupy more volume as compared to cold air parcels, columns of air at the equator, where that direct, more intense solar radiation occurs, are going to be taller than those of the poles, and also, the tropopause height. Now, the tropopause is a layer of the atmosphere, which is a transition zone between the troposphere and the next layer, the second layer of the atmosphere above us, the stratosphere. So that tropopause height, that transition layer at the equator, is going to average, let's say, 15 kilometers above the ground, um, decreasing to 9 kilometers at the poles. So in general, the atmosphere is much more denser at the poles, as compared to the equator. Now, even though the atmosphere extends more than 20 kilometers above the surface, 50% of the atmosphere is concentrated in that lowest 18,000 feet because gases are so compressible. All right, so just a couple important facts when you talk about atmosphere vertical structure. Here is an example of air columns. If we compare a cool air column versus a warm air column, and the actual 500 millibar height. Now, I'll get into the 500 millibar level later on in future training when we talk about weather charts, the importance of 500 millibar um, on the, uh, in that weather forecasting realm with weather charts. But in general, 500 millibars equates to an average of 18,000 feet above the ground. And so you'll notice a shorter air column when we have cooler air as compared to warmer air on the right. And so that 500 millibar height is actually going to vary um, so just imagine that that cool air column on the left represents the polar areas, and then the warm air column on the right represents equatorial areas. And you'll notice there's a big difference there. There's a big difference there between cool air and warm air, and that's just a fact of the matter here. By the way, this graphic is courtesy of the National Weather Service Jetstream, um, the great training resource. All right, so now that we're kind of introduced to the vertical structure of the atmosphere. Now we're going to work our way into talking about various lifting mechanisms. Okay? Now in general, we're interested in these lifting mechanisms. Why are we interested in lifting or rising air motion in the atmosphere? Because that results typically in the clouds we see. Um, eventually those clouds grow thick enough or tall enough. They can actually produce some form of precipitation that reaches the Earth's surface. 
So lifting mechanism is very important to the type of weather we receive here at the Earth's surface. So overall, in order to get air to rise, we have to have something to force it in the vertical. So lifting mechanisms uh, are the ca cause the upward motion of the air, and lifting mechanisms can also disturb vertical equilibrium of the atmosphere by transporting moisture to higher levels in the atmosphere and creating sometimes these unstable vertical profiles and as well as horizontal motions in the atmosphere. All right, so we are going to talk about in today's training four types of lifting mechanisms. We're going to start with mechanical. We'll then move into convergence lifting mechanisms, frontal, and then just simply adiabatic lifting mechanisms. So let's first talk about mechanical lift. Now, mechanical lift, there is a major influence due to terrain, higher terrain, such as hills and mountain ranges, um, that can alter the trajectory of air masses by physically forcing these air masses into the vertical aloft above the surface where we live. Um, and so if you live in a mountainous area, you're very familiar with that diagram in the bottom right. Um, on the windward side of mountains, you typically get upward motion uh, because as the air mass and the wind blows up against the windward side of this mountain, it cannot just go simply through the mountain. It's forced up and over the windward side of the mountain. And as the air rises, it expands and it cools and it produces what's known as condensation. Um, and that condensation is generally a term when we talk about a phase change of water from a water vapor, an invisible water vapor, to liquid. And it usually results in what we see in the sky as clouds. So the windward side, the upward motion, produces this condensation as the air mass rises, squeezing the moisture out of the air mass before it descends the leeward side of the mountain. So major mountain chains such as the Rocky Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, is two, just two examples here in the United States, the windward side tends to have a cooler and wetter climate. It gets more precipitation on the windward side because all, all that moisture is being uh, squeezed out of the atmosphere compared to a location on the leeward side where the air dries out and descends. So we, overall, on the leeward side of these mountains, you can actually get what's known as rain shadows where the vegetation looks much different as compared to the greener vegetation on the windward side. Another type of lift that's very important in the atmosphere is what's known as convergence lift. We get low-level convergence and also converging, when we talk about converging air masses, we're talking about the piling up of these air masses as they collide. And once they collide in the low levels, the atmosphere, they can't go down to the ground. They must go upward and they're forced aloft. And convergence type of lifting will produce this condensation effect once more. Um, the cooling, rising air motion condenses out, forms clouds. And if it gets thick enough, um, the clouds overall or they grow taller in, a, let's say, a summertime situation where the air mass is moist and unstable, we can actually get our precipitation here at the Earth's surface. Now, there's a good example would be a thunderstorm that results from convergence of moisture-laden air masses across the Florida Peninsula. Now, the graphic in the bottom right shows a phenomenon that's known as a um, sea breeze thunderstorm situation where we get low-level converging air we're talking about the Florida Peninsula, and the sun is heating the Earth's surface over Florida. The air is going to rise as that low-level convergence meets. We have a westerly wind coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, an easterly wind coming in off the Atlantic. And where these two air streams meet, the air rises, sometimes vigorously, and produces some rather strong thunderstorms. Now, if you live in Orlando area, central Florida, you're very familiar with this phenomenon, especially during the summer season. Uh, when we have the most intense solar radiation really acting to destabilize things, uh, heating the ground rather efficiently in the summertime. So you can get some you know, typical afternoon showers and thunderstorms as an example. Another location that has this type of effect with the sea breeze is along the Gulf of Mexico. And I've seen this before living down there myself. The next lifting mechanism we'll talk about is what's known as frontal lift. Um, you know, living in the middle latitudes between you know, 30 and 60 degrees north latitude here in the United States, we see fronts coming through all the time. Now, fronts are going to force vertical motion because they tend to act as a wedge. A cold front, for example, is just this wedge of colder, heavier, dense air 
that's in motion. It's moving into an area pushing warmer, moist air ahead of it because that warmer air and moister air is much less dense. It's going to rise. And so that cooler, drier air comes in close. It's basically closest to the ground and it's going to lift the warm, moist air ahead of it. And that's going to result in lifting. Along a warm front, we can get a similar effect where we have warmer, less dense air that's being forced up over a wedge of colder, denser air at the surface. Um, so you can get this frontal lift with cold fronts as well as with warm fronts. But any type of front in general is going to be an area of low level convergence and cause the air to rise. So in both cases, when we talk about a cold front and a warm front, the forced descent of air parcels definitely can result in condensation, again, the formation of clouds and precipitation. And the bottom right hand side of this slide, I'm showing you, you know, the first one there on the left, the bottom left, uh, that's showing you the advancing cold air behind a cold front, acting almost like a bulldozer. It's where that colder, drier air is causing lifting air motion and that warmer air ahead of it. And then the far right, bottom right graphic there shows an advancing warm front where we get more strata form or stratus clouds, but nonetheless a gradual slope and we get some kind of lifting mechanism. The last lifting mechanism I'll talk about is what's known as adiabatic process. And I'm going to get much more into adiabatic processes when I do the um, How the Weather Works training module or part, one of the future parts of the series. I'm going to talk about atmospheric stability and adiabatic processes more in depth. For adiabatic processes, even without mechanical forcing, uh, air parcels in general can pretty much rise on their own and fall as well due to buoyancy forces and these air density differences. Um, air parcel rises generally if it's less dense and warmer than the surrounding air, and it will descend if it is more dense or colder than the surrounding air. And as air parcels rise in general, you're going to get that condensation, the cooling rising air, expanding air parcels, and are going to reach saturation, eventually condensation to form those clouds that we see in the sky, and then precipitation can often result. Uh, adiabatic in general, I, I want you to think more of the summertime in the middle latitudes. That's when we get the most intense solar radiation. And, you know, in the morning time, things are fairly stable. But then by the middle afternoon to late afternoon, we get air parcels to rise because um, they're so much warmer and less dense in the surrounding environmental air. And this sometimes can result in these billowing tall cumulus clouds, as well as the development of what's known as air mass thunderstorms on a daily basis during the summer, um, you know, late afternoon hours and early evening where you get those heavy downbursts of rain, thunder, and lightning. All right, another type of lifting mechanism. Now, this is a special type. Um, we covered the four main ones. Now, I, I have to go into just a brief talk about the special type. There's something known as a density trough uh, where the atmosphere is going to contain a variable amount of moisture uh, increasing the content of this water vapor in the atmosphere at the expense of other gases. That surely explains why moist air is less dense than dry air. So always think this. Moist air is definitely going to be less dense than the drier air, and therefore it's going to want to rise. So if I have this density trough just based on moisture alone, uh, I get something that's known as a dry line. And uh, I'll, I'll break that down here in a moment. Uh, moist air, generally, since it's less dense, it's going to have a positive buoyancy or it's going to want to rise in the atmosphere as compared to dry air. And it can be lifted by this wedge, a wedge of dry air in general, forming what's known, this boundary known as a dry line. Now, if you're from Texas or live in Texas, you know exactly what I'm talking about with these dry lines. Um, when you get this warm, moist, maritime, tropical air mass coming in off the Gulf of Mexico, but then you get this higher elevation dry air coming in from the, south, the U.S. southwestern portion. And um, that difference in moisture between very moist and very dry can really ignite some powerful thunderstorms sometimes um, and result, result in some supercells, even some tornadoes, uh, very large hail with some of this, um, these storms that form along these dry line boundaries. Uh, so dry lines generally behave as lot as these fronts and can produce significant precipitation, including very large hail and severe thunderstorms. Dry lines are most common in that south central U.S. area, Texas in particular, as warm, dry air in advance of a cold front is put into motion. 
and then you get this warm, moist, low-level maritime tropical air, the flow coming in uh, more of a southeasterly wind ahead of the dry line, um, and you get just this clash of density differences between warm, moist air hot, ahead of the dry line and much drier air behind it. On a smaller scale, you get these, uh, if we were looking at just the thunderstorm line that was approaching, you sometimes can get these density troughs to form um, where these individual lines of thunderstorms, you got this descending cooler air from aloft coming down out of the thunderstorm, can actually produce what's known as gust fronts. Um, that's, you know, where's, I don't know if you ever have been experienced this, uh, but in general, the temperature is, is still very warm before the gust front comes in. Uh, you can see the dark clouds coming, basically moving in with the thunderstorms. And uh, sometimes you get like that, as soon as you start feeling that cooler downdraft of air, you get this gust front that moves through and you get this cooler air mass that really drops the temperatures rather rapidly. Um, so in general, gust fronts, another example of a density trough. If the air mass ahead of that gust front is very moist, it can cause development of what's known as a squall line, which is an organized line of thunderstorms. And, and also, you know, really cool on some of the Doppler radar, you can see these outflow boundaries develop, um, which, which is a really cool thing to see too. And so generally with this, moisture is going to condense as the air rises, as, as this condensation process, the conversion from a water vapor to a liquid occurs, it generally releases or liberates heat and warms the layer, making the air more positively buoyant. And this allows the air parcels to continue rising to great vertical heights, and that sometimes, again, as I mentioned previously, results in these explosive thunderstorm development. All right, so let's take a look at the dry line geography here on the left, generally showing what's going on. And these can result in very large hail situations, as well as tornadoes in the south central U.S., parts of north Texas and Oklahoma, where we get warmer, drier air moving in um, to an area which out ahead of that dry line, which is represented by that dash line there on the graphic on the left, um, you get this warm, moist flow of air from the Gulf of Mexico. And when these two density, these major density differences occur between ahead of the dry line and behind the dry line, you can get some explosive thunderstorm development. So just showing you generally where these dry lines occur. And then again, courtesy of weatherprediction.com, Jeff Haby on the right, showing um, a, a general vertical profile of a dry line, which is excellent graphic. So out ahead of it, that dry line itself, you get this moist uh, air mass again coming in from East Texas, the Gulf of Mexico and East Texas, and the drier, much drier air um, aloft coming in from the West Texas area. All right, that wraps up How the Weather Works, Spot on Weather, How the Weather Works, Part 1 or Module 1. This is my first training uh, out of many to come here. So I really hope you're excited, and I really hope that my explanations really allow you to really understand how the weather works. So again, thank you so much for your subscription to the Spot on Weather YouTube channel, absolutely free, um, to get these type of in-depth trainings. Uh, as we head into the warmer season, I like to shift focus more to training. Um, in the wintertime, I like to focus more on the forecasting aspects on the Spot on Weather YouTube channel. So thank you so much again for watching. And until next time, till the next topic, um, looking forward to sharing much of the weather with you and how it works. Take care, everybody, and have a great, great evening.